Hey everybody, my name is D'Artagnan Beats and I'm a Workforce Development Coordinator with the Center for Energy Education. In today's weekly seminar, we're going to be talking about the due diligence of solar farms and how that fits into the life cycle of a solar project. Here to further inform us on the subject is Logan Stevens with GeneX Solar. Hey Logan, how you doing? Hey D'Artagnan, great, thanks for having me today. Anytime. Pleasure. It is a true pleasure. So can you tell us, Logan, um, what is your position with GeneX and how did you get to be so knowledgeable on this process? Sure. So my title at GeneX is Senior Project Developer, and I've been developing solar projects here in the U.S. since 2011. Um, was very lucky coming out of school to get an internship with a company uh, called O2 Energies, based out of Charlotte, um, which is a, another developer, and uh, ended up working there for six years and kind of turning it into uh, what is now my career, uh, working on projects uh, throughout the Southeast and, and now up into the Midwest. So it's been a, a very exciting journey and uh, happy to bring my skill set to GeneX here starting at the, the start of the year and um, and uh, happy to, to share uh, what knowledge I have uh, with C4EE and, and uh, help support all the great work that you guys do. So uh, can you tell us what is due diligence? What does that mean? Yeah, great question. So due diligence sometimes has a like a sort of a boring uh, financial connotation um, yeah. where, and, and it is an important part of the process where the, the financing parties that are involved in uh, providing the money for these projects have to do their due diligence to make sure that uh, the projects have been properly developed and uh, have eliminated all of the, the risks that are um, required in order to invest that money. But in the context of what I do, we sort of expand the meaning of the phrase a little bit to mean um, not only de-risking it for the financing groups, but also de-risking the project in terms of the potential impacts that it might have uh, to the site itself, to the environmental resources of the site, um, to the cultural resources of the site, and to the project community in general. So um, I see it as a, a very important part of the development process kind of from the very beginning when we first start looking for land all the way through until the project is uh, operational and, and delivering power to the grid. So Logan, in speaking about different types of studies and investigations done on the field on the solar site, um, I see you have uh, four broad ones um, with a lot, a lot of different tests, um, some categories being broad categories being civil engineering, uh, cultural, environmental, uh, and those studies related to land and title. Um, out of the many, many that I see here on the civil and engineering, um, could you tell us a little bit about what uh, hydrology uh, study would look like? Sure thing, absolutely. So one of the key things that's important for the construction and long-term operation of the solar farm is understanding where all the water goes on the site whenever we have a big rainstorm event. So especially like throughout the Southeast and the Midwest where we have a lot of projects, um, we are prone to get a lot of rain from time to time. So uh, a hydrology assessment is kind of the first step in the civil engineering process where the engineering firm can actually build a 3D model or at least a 2D model, sometimes 3D, uh, of the site and simulate uh, what's called a 100 year rain event. So this is like, you know, once in a lifetime rainstorm when it rains, you know, five or six inches in a day or something. Um, and they can actually do that and figure out based on how the, the site is shaped and uh, the different features on the site. Um, you know, where the water goes and where it collects on the site. And in general, we want to see uh, no more than two feet of standing water in order to be able to say that that uh, portion of the site is, um, 
is acceptable for putting solar panels. Um, so once we have that hydrology assessment uh, model built out, um, the engineers can use the results of that study and put together uh, all of the civil engineering features that go along with the construction, like where do we put the access roads? Uh, where are we going to need to put erosion control measures? Uh, like sediment basins, silt fencing, all of that kind of good stuff to make sure that uh, we protect the solar equipment, but also that we maintain uh, drainage on site and don't uh, cause, you know, adjacent property owners fields to flood and, and things like that. Uh, moving on and moving forward uh, onto cultural. Um, what does uh, predictive modeling look like? What kind of investigation is that? Yeah, so this happens on the on the very front end. So the agency that typically is responsible for um, preserving, you know, the cultural resources uh, on these sites is the State Historic Preservation Office, which is kind of a mouthful. So usually we abbreviate that and, and say SHPO. <laughs> so the, the SHPO office is uh, the agency that we work with to figure out the best practices for evaluating any potential uh, cultural resources on the site that may be significant and worth uh, preserving. So um, anytime you think about like uh, artifacts or arrowheads or, you know, evidence of, you know, historic or ancient settlements, um, that's kind of what we're talking about. And um, the whole cultural, uh, due diligence process kind of falls into two categories. There's archaeology, which is everything I just mentioned. And there's also um, historic or architectural where we also look at like any historic buildings that may be in the area that we need to be mindful of um, preserving and not impacting either from, uh, from a construction standpoint or, or an aesthetic standpoint. So under that archaeology portion of the cultural um, the predictive model is really important and it's something that is done at a desktop level um, by a qualified consultant and they look at the site because it's such a big uh, area typically. Um, we only want to kind of limit our investigation of the site to the areas that have the highest probability of finding um, those significant archaeological resources. So you know, typically areas that are like near water, roads, um, historic paths, you know, these are areas that have a higher probability of finding these types of artifacts and things because that's where people uh, would have, you know, lived in the past. So uh, we kind of work with the SHPO to develop this model and uh, figure out like what makes the most sense in terms of um, investigating the site so that we don't have to you know, go out there and dig a hole every every foot. In some areas, we dig a little bit closer together because there's a higher probability. In some areas, um, maybe we don't dig quite so many holes to check for stuff. So, um, yeah, that's the predictive model. And then from there, we kind of use that as our guide to go out and do the actual uh, site investigation and look for those things. Okay. Um, yeah, because... I know that, like you said, digging a hole every foot, that is a one process of archaeology if, if you think that area is dense with those kind of artifacts or what have you. Um, so if, you, if there was a site being built around um, a place with historical value or you know, they might have some artifacts, does that prevent you guys from um, constructing the site? Or how, how do you work with that if, if you were to run across that? Yeah, so in some cases it can. If, if, um, if there's something of significance that's found uh, during the field study process, the SHPO may designate that as a, an area that we can't develop uh, because they want to set that aside for further investigation and um, either preserve it or sometimes they'll like collect artifacts and put it in a museum and things like that. So um, you never really know what, what you're going to get when it comes to that. Um, but it is important for us to make sure that we're not impacting uh, those types of resources because they are important. Moving on and forward uh, to the environmental tab, um, what do wetland investigations look like? What kind of studies are those? 
Sure. So wetlands are uh, very, very important natural resources and they're protected under the Federal Clean Water Act. And almost universally, wetland areas are, are pretty much off limits to development without uh, getting special permits that can be very expensive. Um, so as a general rule, when we're developing solar farms, we look to uh, completely avoid wetland impacts wherever possible. In some cases, we will have to cross a wetland, like for example, to build a, a power line. So we might be setting a couple of poles here and there, but we don't want to go in there and, and uh, be placing solar panels or inverters or doing any trenching or anything like that uh, to protect those resources. And so uh, it's very important. It's one of the very first things that we do in the field is send out a consultant to perform a wetland delineation. And what they're doing is they're going around on site and looking for combination of plants and animals and hydrology that indicate, um, you know, that meet all the criteria of, of a wetland under the Clean, the clean Water Act. Um, and so they'll go out and put flags um, and kind of define those wetland boundaries, those keep out areas. Uh, and then we'll incorporate those into our site plan as uh, areas that we want to avoid impacting as much as possible. Um, so, you know, wetlands can take the form obviously of like streams and creeks, but sometimes they're a little less obvious, like areas that are kind of low lying and collect water a lot of the year um, can be considered wetlands and it's not always clear exactly where the line is. So that's why it's important to have um, the specialists go out and delineate those areas. And then they actually work with the Army Corps of Engineers to uh, confirm the line. And we get a sort of a piece of paper from the Army Corps that says they agree with uh, where we've drawn the line. And, and then we can proceed with uh, designing our site around those areas. Wow. Very cool. Yeah. Um, on to lands and tile. This is, this is what, where we wrap it up in where the bucks come in, land and title. Um, what is a topographic survey? Educate me, please. <laughs> sure, yeah, so I picked this one because uh, it's, it's one of my favorite areas. It's um, an area that uh, has really advanced a lot technologically uh, since the invention of um, this technology called LIDAR and LIDAR is short for light detection and ranging. It's, it's similar to like radar or sonar, but instead of using um, radio waves or sound waves, we're using actual like uh, light rays. And I'll explain to you what that means. So uh, topography is uh, basically the change in elevation across the site. Um, so, you know, I mentioned before that in general, we're looking for sites to be as flat as possible but obviously there are no perfectly flat sites, <laughs> especially as you get up towards the mountains um, and we have more slopey areas. It's really important for us to understand with a very high level of accuracy, um, you know, how the topography of the site uh, is. And it's important for a couple of reasons. Number one, it affects uh, what we talked about before with hydrology, like where the water flows on site. And number two, we have to design our solar uh, system, in particular the racking system, to make sure that it can uh, survive on the slope of the site. So we don't want to try to build uh, solar panels on a very steep slope because over time the, uh, the racking system will fail. So in general, we're kind of looking for slopes that are no greater than 10 or 15 percent depending on the the racking manufacturer and so in some cases you'll have areas of the site that are kind of ruled out uh, for development just based on topography um, so coming back to lidar the technology is really cool because what they actually do is fly an airplane over the site and underneath the airplane there's a little instrument that shoots beams of light down at the ground. And they're so finely tuned that based on how long it takes for the light to travel from the airplane to the ground and back up, they can measure with very you know, precise uh, 
um, you know, certainty, like how uh, high the elevation is at that point on the site. Um, so they, they fly over the whole site, they collect all this data, and then they're able to create this very detailed map of, uh, of the site and use that for all those engineering tasks that I mentioned. So um, that one's really cool. Like it, it, the whole LIDAR field is, has uh, replaced a lot of the more uh, traditional survey methods and, and we're able to uh, be a lot more precise and save a lot of money in the process. So, um, Logan, it's been great. Thank you for the information. Thank you for the time you took out uh, to have this discussion with us. Um, again, my name is D'Artagnan Beats, and this is Logan Stevens with GeneX Solar, and we have been discussing uh, the due diligence of solar farms. Uh, thank you. Thanks, D'Artagnan. Really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you today and had a great time.